Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining us. My name is Lun Lak, and I'll be hosting today's session. I'm joining you from Garukul country. I respectfully acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of country throughout Australia and their continuing connection to land, waters, and community. I would like to pay my respect to them, their cultures and elders, past and present. To begin, I have some quick housekeeping messages. First, to obtain a copy of the slides, you can visit our webinar resource hub at tbb.gov.au slash webinar dash hub. Uh, we will also email you a copy of the slides following the session. Today's webinar counts towards your continuing professional education or CPE, and you can claim one hour for attending. In relation to claiming your CPE, we will also issue you with an attendance certificate uh, for those of you staying on for the duration of the, uh, the session today. Uh, let's have a look at what we'll be covering in this session today. So we'll discuss the fundamental of cybersecurity. In particular, we'll be looking at why cybersecurity matters, understand cyber criminals. We'll have a look at the code of professional conduct. We'll consider some of those items. Uh, also have a look at the types of cyber threats. And also we'll talk about um, a few tips to keep you secure, including the essential eight. Then to finish up, I'll hand you over to Julie to address some of the common questions which we received during the session. Now, in that regard, we also have David from our technology team who will be joining us and he'll be responding to some of the questions uh, as they, they come through uh, via the, the, the Q&A. Uh, to find the Q&A, simply move your mouse at the bottom of the screen or at the top and a range of icons will appear uh, and then uh, you can uh, access the, uh, the Q&A function. You can also use the chat function to speak with uh, other participants, but remember, we won't be monitoring that. Um, so if you need a response from us, uh, make sure you type that into the Q&A. Uh, to kick things off, I would like to introduce you to the tax practitioner or chief technology officer, Craig Woodburn. He's our speaker for today. So Craig, I'll hand over to you to get things started. Thanks, Lynn, and welcome everybody. So, uh, so that we all have a shared understanding, let's begin with a basic definition of what is a cyber attack. So a cyber attack is a deliberate act through cyberspace or the internet to manipulate, disrupt, deny, degrade, or destroy computer networks or computers, or even the information that resides on them, which is the, often a, a key target. Uh, with the effect of seriously compromising national security, stability, or economic prosperity. So why does cybersecurity matter? Some of you may think I'm a small business owner or a sole trader, and cybersecurity um, criminals wouldn't be interested in targeting me. Or perhaps maybe cybersecurity is a problem that only IT people need to worry about. Well, the truth is that cybersecurity is an important concern for every organization, large or small. And in fact, the smaller your organization, the more vulnerable you may actually be. And I'm sure you've seen cybersecurity feature in the news lately. Um, it's becoming more and more of an issue. And as tax practitioners, you hold a lot of valuable personal information and cybersecurity, sorry, cyber criminals may target you and your practices in an attempt to harvest that information. Um, they, they might commit identity fraud, or they may launch ransomware or other malicious attacks. Cybercrime is definitely on the rise. The threats are becoming more sophisticated, and it's not a matter of if anymore, but it's a matter of when somebody may try to attack your business. One of the main reasons for that is that we're living more of our lives online and the pandemic uh, definitely accelerated that. Cybercrime is also big business. The average impact of a cyber attack for a small business is about $46,000 per incident and something like around $97,000 per incident for medium businesses. So you can see there's a lot of money to be made by cyber criminals. It can also cause damage in other ways, including downtime, data loss, and reputational damage. So right now in Australia, according to the Australian Cyber Security Centre, um, the, the offshoot of the Department of Defence that look after cybersecurity, 
a cyber crime is reported every six minutes. Um, our slide says seven minutes there, but it's now six. So and scan watch data actually shows that the main delivery methods for these attacks are smartphones and email, which uh, we're all very much dependent on. According to the Australian Signals Directorate, between 150,000 to 200,000 small and home office routers in Australia um, are, are vulnerable to compromise um, in the last financial year. This included compromise from state-based actors. To clarify, a state-based state actor refers to a person or a group acting on behalf of a government or a government body. And it can be an overt or covert uh, intelligence um, they could be, it could be collected by private, military or diplomatic representatives, but it's government sponsored and it's, it's a real threat now. Um, importantly for us here today, the finance industry consistently reports as one of the industries with the most data breaches of all sectors. And you're not far away from that. Unlike breaches impacting large companies, when a small business is hit with a breach, it may not become public knowledge or get reported in the local news but the impact can be devastating. So as you can see, cybersecurity is something we all need to address and we all need to be aware of. By participating today, we hope to help you get better performed, uh, get better informed of common cybersecurity issues and learn ways to improve your security and reduce your risk. You'll also become familiar with resources to help learning about this topic and, and organisations that are there to assist you. So please don't feel you, you can't address cybersecurity. It's important and you can, and we can help you. Now, I wanna to just touch briefly on the motivations of cyber criminals. It may appear obvious based on what you've, we've already discussed, but let's just break it down for a moment. A whopping 41% of recent attacks demand a ransom. No surprises there, financial gain is the primary motivation of a hacker. But there are other reasons too. One of them is disruption and the fact that these hackers really don't care about, some of them may not care about money or data, but they're driven by a specific purpose. They might take it upon themselves to expose a so-called injustice, or they may have political, environmental, religious, or moral motives and they're hacking in an attempt to be heard or make a difference. We have spamming where malware can take over your web browser systems and overwhelm you with unwanted ads. And it's from this that spammers then can steal passwords or use your email or your social media accounts to spam others to sell products. Fourthly, we have espionage. And this is a, another type of theft really. Um, except for instead of direct financial gain, the hackers are seeking protected information or intellectual property. Both governments and private organisations can be victims of information theft and, uh, and intellectual property theft. And the, the information stolen can be sold or used to gain strategic advantage in, in an industry. And then finally, a, another major driver is that many hackers will tell you that breaking into a secure system is an enjoyable hobby that tests their knowledge and skills, almost just like a challenge. And for these people, the only motivation is to gain experience and have some fun. It's crazy, but it's true. First, to fit, just to finish this section, I'll let you know that most cyber attacks are triggered by outsiders, organized crime, and insiders as well. According to a data breach report by Verizon, most breaches, around 70%, are caused by outsiders and organised crime groups. Um, uh, sorry, organised crime groups accounted for 55% of the 70%, so a, a very high, high ratio there. Let's look at cybercrime. So to put things into context, I want to share some information with you now about how cyber, uh, how, how cybercrime works. I mentioned earlier a cyber crime is reported every six minutes, but to really understand how common cyber security incidents are in Australia, I think we need to look at what happens in those six minutes. How many people received an SMS, email or phone call 
that attempted to get them to hand over personal details or money. I should be putting my own hand up. I get them all the time. How many business networks or devices were accessed by unauthorized users? The Australian, Australian Cyber Security Centre reports that fraud-related cybercrime, where criminals use computers or online services to commit fraud, accounted for nearly 23% of cybercrime reports a few years back. Online shopping scams were the second most reported cybercrime at 17%, followed by online banking scams at 12%. The remaining 48% of cybercrime is spread fairly evenly between identity theft, business email compromise, investment, selling, bulk extortion, and romance scams. They also highlighted malicious emails such as phishing to be the greatest threat for cybercrime. SMS has also become a popular tool for cyber criminals seeking to help people part with their money. The reason for the rise in SMS cyber crime appears to be the lack of protections on SMS. It's, uh, there, there are no um, spam filters and so on on SMS, and, and that is a problem. Compare that with email services, which um, almost all of them have good spam filters built in these days. Cyber criminals put the greatest effort into the areas that will give them the most reward. With minimal spam protection, decreasing costs, and access to sophisticated technology that generates spoof numbers, SMS scams and even phone scams are hard to stop. Hackers have also noticed how many of us are waiting for online shopping deliveries. And if you're anything like our household, you've probably received an SMS from a bogus provider, courier, Australia Post, whoever, uh, offering or uh, telling you about a, a delivery that's coming up to your door and asking you to pay an extra duty or confirm your, your details um, so they can harvest those from you. But it's not the courier and it's not Australia Post at all. Most of these SMS cybercrimes fall into the largest type of cybercrime in Australia, and that's fraud. The Australian... Competition and Consumer Commission, so the ACCC's Scam Watch website, reports that the dollar value of losses to SMS scams is on the rise. They, uh, they doubled from just over $3 million in uh, 2020 to over $8 million in 2021. And it's an, a trend that was observed in the US and the UK as well. Self-reported losses from cybercrime came to an eye-watering $33 billion in the 2021 20, uh, 20, financial year. And the ACCC also revealed that almost 170,000 Australians reported $143 million lost to scams in that financial year. By combining that figure with additional data from government agencies and the big four banks, ACCC raised uh, that, financial, that financial loss figure to $634 million. With all the community education that they've contributed, this figure is still high at $569 million in 2022 and $480 million in 2023. So it is improving a little bit in some sectors of the market, but only slightly. So with some rough maths, we can see that over $30 billion of the self-reported losses from cybercrime come from business rather than individuals. However, there's one problem with these figures. Financial losses from scams and cybercrime are often not reported. Some businesses don't report when they've experienced a cyber attack or paid a ransom because it might harm their reputation. What that means is that we don't have an accurate picture of the quantity or the frequency of cyber attacks. Really, the figures that I've stated are just the tip of the iceberg. Okay, it wouldn't be a TVB webinar if we didn't talk about the Code of Professional Conduct. So let's take a quick look at the relevant items of the code in the context of cybersecurity. First, let's look at Code Item 6, which is particularly relevant to cybersecurity. Under Code Item 6, you must disclose, you must not disclose any information relating to a client's affairs 
to a third party unless you've done two things. You've obtained the client's permission or there's a legal duty for you to do so. Where a breach of confidentiality occurs as a result of a cyber incident, we would need to consider the IT controls in place to determine what administrative sanctions, if any, should be imposed. You must ensure that you have appropriate arrangements in place to pr prevent inadvertent disclosure of client information through recklessness. It makes good business sense anyway, doesn't it? Secondly, let's have a look at code item seven, which states you must ensure that a tax practitioner service that you provide, or that is provided on your behalf, is provided competently. So why is this code relevant? Because if tax practitioners don't have sufficient IT controls in place and are reckless in their approach to cybersecurity, we may determine that they've not provided their service to clients competently and therefore that they've breached the code. Ultimately, depending, determining if a registered tax practitioner has complied with their obligations under the code requires each situation to be considered individually. So in the interest of time, I won't delve into the details of the sanctions today, but we'll share some information after the webinar if you'd like to know more. Let's break down the most common types of cybersecurity threats. Understanding some of the most typical cybersecurity threats will be useful as you consider the particulars of your business and your information systems. In this section, I'll talk about specific threat types that you may encounter. Examples include business email compromise, phishing attacks, malware, ransomware, imposter scams, identity theft, data breaches, and hacking. So what is a, a business email compromise, or uh, BEC for short? BEC is where malicious actors compromise an organization via email. Criminals target organizations and try to scam them out of their money or goods. They also target employees and try to kick, trick them into revealing important or confidential business information. BEC is a form of spear phishing. Criminals use emails to pretend to be business representatives. They also use the compromised email accounts of employees. Despite the best efforts of law enforcement agencies, only a small fraction of these financial losses are ever recovered. Now let's look at phishing attacks. Phishing attacks are the practice of sending fraudulent communications that appear to come from a, a reputable source, usually through email. In a phishing attack, the bait is made to look as realistic as possible to hook you. The goal is usually to steal sensitive data like credit card or logon information or to install malware on your computer. And there's usually a sense of trust. They use your name or some element of information to establish a connection. They're wanting to sound believable. They also use brands, logos and links that look correct, but they're misleading or they're fake. They often have a sense of urgency compelling you to take action or something bad will happen, and some have actual people ready to respond if you make the mistake of requesting further information. Common phishing attacks that I'm sure you've seen include an email being, uh, pretending to be from a bank with instructions to share your logon information. They're quite common. An offer from a, it would be probably five or, or 10 years back now that I can remember receiving one of these, but an offer from a prince to share untold millions of unclaimed gold or one uh, that I've seen um, recently uh, where you, you've got some lottery winnings or, or whatever. An email from someone senior in the organization might even ask you to purchase gift cards to reward staff for great work. That's one we've even seen here. Now imagine if the email is addressed to someone in your practice and the name used is correct, as is their work title. Perhaps they pretend to be from your company's bank or even the name of one of your trusted, um, even the name of your trusted loan officer. 
This fake email is a spear phishing attack. And this is because of the precise method used to, uh, to get past your normal screening approach and to increase the chance that you'll believe their request is legitimate. The technique isn't just limited to email either, as I said earlier, with phone and SMS being used to snag you too. So, but you can protect yourself from these attacks by remaining aware, training staff and yourself on how to recognize the common traits of a phishing attack. No single cybersecurity technology can prevent phishing attacks. So you need to take a layered approach to reduce the success of these attacks and lessen their impact when they do occur. Email and web browser security are essential, of course, as is malware protection, uh, user behavior monitoring and access control. And we'll talk about that more soon. Now let's uh, have a quick look at malware. As I mentioned, one of the goals of a phishing attack is to install malware on your computer. So let's look at what this means. So malware, which is short for malicious software, is software that cybersecurity or cyber criminals use to harm your computer or network or to gain access to your computer without you knowing about it. Malware attacks can be targeted to you or they could be broad-based attacks. Cyber criminals use malware for many different reasons, but common types of malware are used to steal your confidential information. They might hold your computer or your data to ransom or install other programs without your knowledge. Types of malware might include Trojans, where there's a, a real legitimate program that, you, that might have a, a useful purpose, um, but when you install it, it also in, installs some malware on your computer. Trojans may steal information, download additional malicious files, or even provide a backdoor into your computer so that a hacker can access it later. Just warning you though, Trojans uh, are often looking like a, a, a legitimate piece of software that you might even know that uh, is just you're just downloading it from a different website from where you normally where other people might have downloaded it from, but it's got this Trojan embedded within it, so it can be very hard to find. Viruses and worms is another type of malware where malicious programs infect files, they insert themselves into the file's code, and then they run whenever the file's used. Worms are standalone malicious programs that spread themselves from computer to computer. Similar to Trojans, but these ones replicate themselves. Another innocuous malware uh, type of malware is a keylogger. These are a small piece of malware that will log every keystroke you make on your keyboard. And it sends that information, including passwords, bank account numbers, credit card numbers, the lot, to scammers for fraudulent use. And finally, ransomware, which I'll talk about in a bit more in a moment. But uh, ransomware is the final type of malware that we'll talk about today. The malware is distributed by spam, emails or messages, or even malicious websites that attempt to install um, their software. Uh, on, on your computer when you visit them. Uh, malware is also distributed by masquerading as a, as a good application that you download, as I said earlier, and install yourself. So just be very careful when you're downloading software and, um, and, and the ability to download software on your organization's computers and install it on your computer should be something that um, is reserved from only those people who are, uh, are very savvy to cyber threats. You can protect yourself by installing the files that you need and sourcing them from only well-known and legitimate app stores. Other things you can try and, that you can avoid would be downloading applications from third-party download sites, clicking on online ads to download applications, downloading and installing applications from peer-to-peer -peer networks. Um, you never know who's changed the files. Uh, clicking on links in emails or instant messages or executing attachments unless you're sure that they're legitimate. You're getting the story here. Anything you install on your computer will potentially give somebody else that you don't want to have access to your information and to control your computer.
Now let's look at ransomware just quickly. Let's just circle back to ransomware. So ransomware is software that you can that can encrypt or lock your data behind a secret code or a passcode on your computer. And without that code, your data or your network becomes inaccessible. And you're literally frozen out of your own files and your own information. Worse, the malware author will include a threat, often a short window of time by which you must pay them a ransom. Failure to meet their demands will cause them to lock or destroy your information. Or even worse, uh, they, may, they may leak it. The decision whether to pay a ransom is very difficult. Sometimes there's tools available from security vendors that will undo the ransomware, but often there's no available remedy. And it's important to know, even if you do pay the ransom, of course, there's no guarantee that you'll regain access to your information, nor prevent it from being sold or leaked online. And this is exactly what happened with, um, with Optus, I think it was, recently in the news a while back. You may also be targeted by another attack because you're a soft target now. If you're a victim of a ransomware attack, we absolutely recommend you contact the Australian Cyber Security Centre 24 seven hotline. You can look that number up on there, that number for them up on their website, um, Australian Cyber Security Centre, or it's 1300 Cyber, C-Y-B-E-R one, 1300 Cyber one. So what should you look out for? Ransomware can infect your devices in the same way as any other malware, um, or viruses. For example, it could um, you could uh, be visiting an unsafe or suspicious website and it'll latch onto your computer. You could be opening emails or files from unknown sources that might have embedded files in them. You could be clicking on malicious links in emails or in social media. Common signs that you might be a victim of a malware attack, uh, sorry, of a ransomware attack, might be pop-up messages requesting funds or payment to unlock files. Um, you might find that you can't access your devices or your logon won't work for some for, for an unknown reason, or you might find that files uh, are requesting a password or a code when they you haven't set that up and and um, uh, yeah no one no one in your organisation has set that up directly. Let's move on to imposter scams before we move on to what we can do to to help you uh, address these risks. Imposter scams are exactly what they sound like. Criminals pose as someone or something else to try to convince you to send them money. You may have received an unsolicited phone call from someone claiming to work for a big computer company. They might have noticed viruses on your computer or a hacker trying to get into your computer. It's quite ironic because they're actually trying to do the same thing and offer to help you to remove the risk and repair the damage, of course, for a fee. Or perhaps you may have been called by someone claiming to be with the ATO, sadly, and they've made an error on your tax and you must pay a fine right away. If you're like me, you've received at least one of each of these. There are some more personal scams where people target the elderly and they claim to be their grandchild or in trouble, needing funds to... be sent to them urgently, just beware. Uh, be careful and alert when anticipated calls, texts, or emails, or even instant messenger uh, messages. Um, we'll look at ways you can protect yourself with scams later though in this webinar. Next, let's look at identity theft. So as I said, many attacks are aimed at stealing your identity. Identity theft is when a cyber cr criminal gains access to your personal information to steal money or gain other benefits it's in your name. They can get loans, benefits, apply for real identity documents in, name, in your name, um, all but with another person's photograph. The financial and emotional consequences can be devastating for victims. Once your identity has been stolen, it can be difficult to recover and you may have problems for years to come. And they're playing around with your, your reputation here, not just it's your good name that they're actually stealing. A cyber criminal may look to steal a range of personal information about you, including, of course, your name, your date of birth, 
your driver's license number, uh, your your address, maybe some of the answers to those those security questions you might have on that website, like your mother's maiden name or your place of birth, or maybe it's simply financial. They want you your credit card details, your tax file number, your Medicare card, or your passport information, or even your your PIN number for your your bank card, your bank account. Uh, it might even be an online user username or you log on. And it's sometimes the efforts of hackers to fool you into giving these up are quite elaborate. There are some common warning signs though that indicate your identity has been stolen. Look out for bank statements that show purchases or withdrawals that you've not made. Uh, look also for emails that you normally receive, that you would normally receive, but they're not showing up. So for example, maybe an electricity bill is no longer um, appearing like it should. Um, keep an eye out for bills or receipts for anything that you've, um, you haven't purchased or statements for loans or credit cards you haven't applied for. A government agency could also inform you that you're receiving a government benefit that you've never applied for, obvious warning signs, um, or perhaps a credit refusal um, because of a, a poor credit history due to debts that you've not even incurred. All the are good indicators that somebody's been um, mucking around with your, messing around with your identity. So let's look at some things that we can do to protect ourselves and our clients at the same time. Cyber criminals can learn a lot about you from your social media accounts. So limit what you share online and reconsider sharing information on so social media, uh, information like your birthday, uh, photos of a new house that shows your address, or photos that identify your children's school or details of schools that you've attended. These details, are, these details as I said earlier, are often used for security questions um, on, on financial and other important accounts. Next, set your social media privacy settings to private. If somebody doesn't know you, they don't need to access all of this information that would be a treasure trove for them if they're trying to steal your identity. Educate your, your children in the same, yeah, in the same uh, vein to not expose private identity information publicly uh, unless they really need to, to really consider that carefully. Think twice before entering your personal details into a website you're not familiar with. Be careful accessing information over public or untrusted Wi-Fi networks. So next time you, you go down to that cafe, just be careful. You're much safer using your phone's uh, internet um, through your, your phone um, uh, contract on your mobile phone than you are using the Wi-Fi network at the cafe. You don't even know if you're actually connecting to the cafe's Wi-Fi network or somebody else's Wi-Fi network they've got running along the side that's designed just to harvest your information. Anything that's sent over a Wi-Fi network that you've joined is not necessarily private. Always lock your mailbox and shred any sensitive documentation you no longer need. Throwing bills in the trash uh, without ripping them up or shredding them is, is no longer safe. Uh, be wary of phone calls that ask for your personal information too. Another important point I'd like to make today is being careful when onboarding new clients. We'll share our guidance on this after the webinar, but our proof of identity guidelines will help you to meet your obligations to secure the personal and financial details of your clients. The guidance outlines appropriate requirements for verification. This includes defining the documents to be cited maintaining records and recommendations about achieving remote verification of clients. Now, I won't unpack this right now for the sake of time, but make sure when citing documents that the photo in the ID appears to match the details and appearance of the client and or their representative. Also check to make sure the name, address and date of birth all match the information provided by the client or the representative. One thing we strongly recommend is to not use email for communicating sensitive information, such as IDs of clients, except, except perhaps when you might have an encryption 
um, or, or password protected uh, environment to use. Remember, email is not considered a secure form of transmission, as there's a risk of emails being intercepted by third parties during transmission. This is quite common. You need to consider that emails are almost like the electronic equivalent of a postcard sent in the mail. You know, the postcard you receive in the mail and, and uh, from, from Auntie Jean, and uh, you, you pass it on to your child who's been sent it, but everybody else in the house has already read it anyway. Exactly the case. Anyone could read your email without you knowing. Data breaches. These are quite topical, have been lately. Been some quite high profile ones um, in the news. A data breach occurs when sensitive or personal information is accessed, disclosed or exposed to unauthorized people. Now this could be an accident even from someone within your organization or it could be the result of a security breach. However, if client information is involved in a data breach, the potential consequences can be far reaching. The information could be used to gain access to online accounts, uh, it could be used in targeted scams or to steal your identity. An example is when an email with personal information is sent to the wrong person or a computer system's hacked and personal information is stolen. There are actions that you can take though to minimize the likelihood and impact of a data breach. This includes, firstly, minimizing the amount of personal information that you store. Can I suggest, don't keep copies of identity documents that you use to verify a client's identity. You don't need a permanent copy of their driver's license, their birth certificate or their passport. Look at your cybersecurity and ensure that you have good protections in place. And we'll look at that in a moment. Avoid reusing passwords as a data breach can occur that compromises that password. And if you've reused that password across other accounts, a smaller breach instantly becomes bigger. Use multi-factor authentication across your accounts whenever it's available and demand it whenever you can. And finally, back up important information. Now, before we move on, I'd like to touch on the Notifiable Data Breaches Scheme. This scheme applies to organizations covered by the Privacy Act, including those who are tax file number recipients. So there'll be many of you. So if this, if this scheme, so this scheme would apply to registered tax practitioners and would cover data breaches resulting from a cyber attack. Under the Notifiable Data Breaches Scheme, Entities are required to notify affected individuals and the Office of the Australian Information Commissioner when they experience a data breach. Um, that data breach might be likely to result in serious harm to any individuals where information is involved. This ensures the individuals at risk can take remedial steps to lessen the impact that might arise. This includes monitoring their accounts or taking preventative measures like changing their passwords or even their tax file number. Importantly, not every data breach, including those that include personal information, constitutes an eligible data breach that has to be reported. So the question of serious harm arising from a data breach sits at the center of the operation of this scheme. And the initial uh, assessment is deferred to the entity experiencing the data breach. Entities should assess the risk of serious harm holistically, considering the likelihood of the harm eventuating as part of the breach and the consequences. So very much like a, a risk framework. What's the likelihood something's going to happen? And what are the consequences of that happening? The scheme includes a non-exhaustive list of uh, relative, relevant matters that may assist entities to assess the likelihood of serious harm. I won't go into all the details of this, but just want to make you aware, um, and we can send you a link for, with further information after our webinar today. Okay, let's finish up uh, this, this section before we start looking at how you can protect yourself uh, in more detail uh, by looking at hacking. So hacking refers to an attack on your network or your systems, the systems that you use, often to exploit a system's data or manipulate its normal behavior. 
typically a hacking attack can occur without anyone ever setting foot in your office. They gain access via the internet or, or perhaps on your own network. In that case, they might need to, to access your, your office somehow or even just be in the, the, um, the, uh, the near proximity uh, by accessing your Wi-Fi network perhaps. Hackers find a way to break into a network or an account, just like a thief finds a way to break into a home. And often finding out a password is the very first step in cracking a network security, the access code. And once in, a hacker can modify how a network works. They can steal data, they can obtain passwords, they can get personal information. They can watch what you're doing or install malware to further the attack. While hacking is often highly targeted, uh, some hacking tools such as ransomware or malware can spread on their own via links and attachments or further follow up by a hacker personally um, yeah, at, at a, an opportune time later on. Hacking can also um, occur when a trusted employee or a visitor to your physical environment abuses your trust by illegally accessing other areas of your business. So what should you do if you're hacked? If you've been hacked, it might not be too late to recover and protect yourself or your business. First, you should make a record of the key details of the incident. This includes what happened, when it happened, if someone contacted you, how you responded, and so on. Some things you can do to stop further access by the hacker include the obvious, disconnect from the internet. You could scan for viruses to identify and remove any malware. You, you should strongly consider changing all your passwords and passphrases. You should notify your clients and other networks to be on the alert for any strange links or email attachments. And if someone has stolen sensitive data, as we've already talked about before, the Australian Cybersecurity uh, Centre can help. The Office of the Australian Information Commissioner might be need to be told. Your bank or credit union, you perhaps should tell immediately. Uh, if, if, particularly if their financial details are stolen, and the ATO. Tax professionals are required to notify the ATO if there's been an unauthorised disclosure of TFNs under the confidentiality provisions of the Tax Administration Act. We'll also share a link to the Australian Cyber Security Centre's interactive tool after this meeting uh, called Have You Been Hacked? And, uh, and it can help you discover and recover from uh, common cyber incidents. So a few tips before we move on. Understand this might be all a little bit overwhelming. So I wanna give you some everyday tips that can help you stay safe and protect your client's data. It's not that hard, um, but the most valuable tip from the TVB's perspective is to be proactive. So everyday tips. The first and simplest resource to help you get started is the Australian Cyber Security Centres, ACSC, uh, Essential 8. Easily found by navigating to the website at cyber.gov.au. Small to medium businesses should be aiming to implement at least maturity level one risk mitigations from the Essential 8. We'll talk more about this in a moment, but as a minimum, we would consider the following to be best practice. Firstly, install and maintain antivirus and anti-malware software on your computer. Now, if you're a Windows user, Microsoft are taking care of this already for you. There's a built-in Microsoft Defender system. As long as you've got updates enabled, um, which is recognized by experts as being a most capable choice, detecting over 99% of our attempted attacks. Secondly, deploy firewalls in your workplace computers, on your workplace computers or your workplace networks. Again, ensuring that you've got built-in Windows firewall, um, that the built-in Windows firewall enabled would be a wise choice here. So you don't need to spend a lot of money here, but you definitely need to be proactive to protect yourselves. Enjoy your, and ensure that your computer operating system and other programs always have the latest security updates. This is increasingly becoming more and more critical and is so easy to address by just enabling automatic updates in most instances. 
Fourthly, enable multi-factor authentication wherever you can. For example, SMS or even much better, an authentication app to protect your online accounts. Multi-factor authentication blocks a whopping 99.9% .9 of modern automated cyber attacks. It even blocks 96% of bulk phishing attempts and even 76% of high investment targeted attacks by hackers. So if you're in an office with multiple employees, ensure people only have the access that they need to do to their jobs as well. And this is not an issue of trust, but more so if a hacker manages to compromise one of your staff members' accounts, the damage done will be limited because their access is limited. Other things you can do include protect, protecting client records or files using encryption wherever possible, ensuring they're backed up at least once a day. Be careful of email attachments, web links and voice calls from unknown numbers. Ensure staff are educated not to click on a link or open an attachment that they're not expecting. Use separate personal and business computers, mobile devices and accounts. Definitely don't uh, download software from an unknown web page. Never give out your username or password, even to somebody you trust. And consider the use of a password management application to store your passwords for you. Never ever write them down. So let's talk about the essential eight that I mentioned earlier. While no set of mitigation strategies is guaranteed to protect against all cyber threats, and the essential eight is no exception, organizations are urged to implement at least these eight essential mitigation strategies as a baseline. This baseline, which is known as the essential eight, makes it much harder for adversaries to compromise systems. The, the prioritized mitigation strategies that form the essential eight help organizations pr protect themselves against various cyber th threats on internet connected um, information technology networks. So the, the essential eight works in three ways. It, it goes, it sets to protect you from attacks. It sets to limit the amount of damage that can be done in the event of an attack. And then thirdly, it seeks to give you a recovery position so that if you do get attacked and somebody does manage to do some damage, then you can recover from that damage. It's a very clever defense in depth uh, approach. So these are the, the main mitigation strategies. Application control, uh, an application, uh, sorry, an approach in which only an explicitly defined set of trusted applications are allowed to run on your computers. So there's software that's cheap to buy, reasonably easy to set up, that only allows software on your computer that you know about and you've explicitly put on there to run. Secondly, patch applications. Ensure that your application software is maintained with the latest security bug and feature updates. So if you're using Google Chrome, for example, make sure you're downloading the latest or you've got it set up on automatic update, the latest updates for Google Chrome. The last thing you wanna do is disable that, that auto update feature, which some people do thinking they want a more stable computer, uh, but in fact, they're getting the opposite. Thirdly, configure Microsoft Office macro settings, and this is easily achieved by controlling the location where macros can be run and ensuring that they're trusted. Um, so you significantly minimize risks. You really don't want to avoid, you really want to, sorry, you really don't want the possibility that someone can send an email to you or one of your staff with an embedded Microsoft Office macro, say within a Word document, that can be executed without careful checking. This is a really common risk. Some, uh, some antivirus software will protect you to some extent from this risk, but no antivirus software can know every different macro that exists that could cause you harm. So it's worthwhile just having good practices for this. User application hardening. 
harden your applications and, and your Windows, Mac, or Linux, or, or other operating system uh, means that you, you're using the best security features of your IT to protect yourself from cyber criminals. There are many settings on your computers. When you look in at the Australian Cyber Security Centre um, advice on this, even at the maturity level one, where they'll tell you, here's some settings you can set up on your computers that will make uh, your applications more resilient and, and more protected from being hacked. Fifthly, restricted ministry of privileges. This is a really important one. People who've been given elevated administrative privileges to a system or your office network often don't understand the great level of responsibility that they've been entrusted with. You should keep the number of staff with privileged access to a minimum, and you should ensure that they only use their special admin accounts when absolutely required to do their job, and that they're protecting uh, their, their admin username and password with extreme care. Admins often have full access to your systems and the data and, and, and a compromise would be devastating. So be careful to remove access for admin accounts, uh, admin account holders when they leave your business or even they just no longer require this level of system access. This is a, a point of vulnerability that you really want to minimise. And it's not just about trusting the staff members I've said. If somebody were using their admin account a lot and somebody managed to, a hacker or uh, an adversary managed to find out the username and password for a, uh, an admin account, um, or managed to compromise their, their multi-factor authentication, um, and we'll talk about that in a moment, then they've got the keys to the kingdom in your business. So this is a weak point. Next, patch operating systems means keeping your device's operating system, for example, Windows or Mac OS, up to date, um, but this also includes mobile devices like phones, tablets, and network devices even. And then finally, uh, multi-factor authentication and regular backups. And we'll talk about these two points a bit more in a moment in detail. However, when implementing the Essential 8, you should identify and plan for a target maturity level suitable for your environment. As I said before, I'd highly recommend a maturity level one but I'd be feeling more comfortable with a maturity level two, depending on the size of the business. The essential eight mitigation strategies have been designed to complement each other and to provide coverage of various cyber threats. Therefore, you should plan their implementation to achieve the same maturity level across all eight mitigation strategies before moving on to higher maturity levels. There's no point in having um, maturity level three, which is the maximum, um, for um, application control, but having no multi-factor authentication. Um, too much of a weakness. So yes, try and, try and get them all up to maturity level one and then set forward from there. And an improvement from where you are now is gonna be extra security for you. As the Essential 8 outlines a minimum set of preventive measures, organizations need to implement additional measures to those within the maturity model where it's warranted by your environment. So, as I've alluded to already, the essential eight consists of four maturity levels, maturity level zero to maturity level three. Maturity level zero pretty much means you, you're doing nothing, um, but the maturity levels are based on mitigating increasing levels of, of tradecraft in, in adversaries. When we talk about tradecraft, craft, we're talking about tactics, techniques, procedures used by, by attackers. So maturity level zero means that that there are weaknesses in an organization's overall cybersecurity posture. When exploited, those weaknesses could facilitate the compromise of the confidentiality of your data or the integrity or availability of your systems. Maturity level one would mean you're focused on malicious attackers who are content, content to uh, simply leverage commodity trade craft or look for well-known, um, well-known uh, soft spots, I suppose, in your systems. So for example, a malicious actor might opportunistically use a publicly available exploit for a vulnerability in an internet-facing service like Google Chrome or Microsoft Edge, which hasn't been patched. 
or they might authenticate to an internet facing service using credentials that they managed to steal from you. Um, they could have even uh, stole a credential from somewhere else and you've reused it. So they've effectively got the same credential for, for something that's much higher value. Or maybe they've even guessed a password. Password one, two, three uh, is not gonna cut it. Secondly, um, generally malicious actors are looking for a victim, for any victim, rather than a specific victim. So this is material level one that you're protecting yourself against. Um, they will off opportunistically seek common weaknesses in many targets. So these are people that are not investing a huge amount of effort into you individually, but they're actually uh, taking a scattergun approach to try and gain access to as many possible systems as they can. Malicious actors in the, that you're protecting yourself with maturity level one would be malicious actors that employ common social engineering techniques to trick users into weakening the security of their system. If accounts, um, the malicious actors compromise a special privileges, then they'll exploit them. So depending on their intent, malicious actors, uh, actors can also destroy data. So this is maturity level one. This is why I say maturity level one is absolutely essential. Maturity level two focuses on malicious actors operating with um, a modest step up in capability from the previous maturity level. So these actors are willing to invest more in, in a target and their, the effectiveness of their tools. For example, they might employ well-known tradecraft by, um, to bypass controls uh, implemented, by, implemented by a target and evade detection. This includes actively targeting uh, credentials, um, using phishing and employing technical and social engineering techniques. They might uh, also be more selective in their targeting and select people that have um, higher, higher value. Um, they might be targeting more financial businesses or um, particular people that, that have, them, have, have a greater opportunity for them. And then finally, maturity level three focuses on malicious actors who are more adaptive and um, are much less reliant on public tools and techniques. So this is where attacks become more targeted. These actors exploit opportunities provided by weaknesses in their, in their targets, uh, cybersecurity, such as the existence of old software or inadequate logging and monitoring. They do this to extend their access once gained and to evade detection and solidify their presence. These people cover their tracks. Generally, malicious actors have been, will be very focused on particular targets, and more importantly, they're willing and able to invest effort into circumventing the technical controls that people might have raised to try and prevent attacks. So for example, this, this includes social engineering a user to not only open a malicious document, but also to unknowingly assist in bypassing controls. To finish up today, I'd like to break down some of the tips that I've mentioned in a little more detail. So let's start with updates. Updates is one of the strongest defenses in your security toolkit, and they're so easy to do. Updating your device and applications can fix issues and address new security concerns. Updates can also add new features to your app or your device. So updates are new, improved or fixed versions of software. And, and I, I know it's frustrating, but in, in many cases, there's a new version of Google Chrome that comes out every week or a new version of, uh, of that update for your your iPhone or your, uh, or your Windows computer. Sometimes they can be frequent. Don't skip them um, because it, you could be taking a, an unacceptable risk. Regular updates are critical in maintaining a secure system and it's important to check regularly. Cyber criminals hack devices by using weaknesses that have been, pu that have been published when these updates have been released. So if somebody releases a, a new update, they say, we're addressing this weakness in the system. Um, sometimes that information is included. It's a flag to, to hackers. Look for people who've got the old version of this software. They're an easy target. 
Secondly, back up regularly. We all keep inf important information on our devices. And this is the part of the essential eight that protects you when it all turns to custard. If somebody manages to get in your environment, have a backup so that if they try to, to uh, ransom you and they manage to get in your environment, they've, they've locked up all your files and your data, you'll always have a copy of your data available to recover from. If your data is damaged or stolen, it can be hugely expensive, very expensive, or even impossible to recover it. And that's why it's important to back up your data regularly. It's a digital copy of your most important information and it's where copies of your files are saved to an external storage device or an online server that might be located in the cloud, for example. Backing up and having backups means you can restore your files when it all goes wrong and it's a precautionary measure so that your data is accessible in case something happens to your computer. It's okay to be backing up for years and never have needed a backup, but it's still worth doing. Next, turning on multi-factor authentication. We've talked about this a little bit already, but it provides extra checks to prove your identity. For example, you may need an authentication code from a text message in addition to your password to log into your account. I'd like to talk a little bit about SMS in a minute and, and the security of it, but SMS, so MFA, multi-factor authentication, provides an extra layer of security. It typically requires a combination of something each person knows or a user knows, something a person has, and something a user is, like a fingerprint, to access a device or an application or an online service. Having two or even more authentication factors increases your cybersecurity. It's easy for somebody in another city uh, or on another computer or even another country, or well, it might not be easy, but it, but it might be achievable for them to actually steal your password by tricking you into giving it up, but it's so much harder for them to actually take over your mobile phone. In fact, MFA blocks 99.9%, .9%, as I said earlier, of automated cyber attacks and 96% of bulk phishing attacks and even 76% of targeted attacks. So some, some authentication factors that you use for use with MFA include a physical token that might provide a one-time only pin, um, a little, little RSA device you might've seen. The banks used to give those out. It could include a security pass key uh, these are more modern and these can be used in addition um, or to, in place of a password. They act a little bit like an electronic key and they can be stored on mobile devices or other security devices. It could include a multi-factor, uh, might include biometrics or a fingerprint, perhaps a, a face scan or a virus scan. And you've seen them used on a lot of modern mobile phones. Uh, an authenticator app. Um, this is a mobile application that generates a random code or an approval to log on to a service. These are much more secure than SMS, so much more secure because an SMS is often visible on your phone when you're not even, even attending, you're not even using your phone. Um, and the other thing is people can steal mobile phone numbers. Um, so yes, uh, an authenticator app, if it's available to you, is a better option. Um, and for that reason, the TPB will be migrating to that type of approach sometime down, sometime soon. But there's also SMS, as I've said, email or voice call, where you get a random code that gets given to you via that path, and then you uh, use that code, you enter it into the logon process, and you gain access. Um, all very good ways to protect yourself from that person who is a long way removed, perhaps in a different city or in a different country, and they're seeking to gain access to your systems. Let's just talk briefly about passphrases. So passphrases are more secure than passwords. So a password, is typically eight to 12 characters, um, depending on how strong your password rules are. And uh, it's not a really a very large number of characters. Passphrases, are much more secure than passwords. They're made up of random words, making them longer than a traditional password. It makes them harder to guess, but much easier for you to remember. 
much less chance of you wanting to record a pass phrase somewhere on a piece of paper, which I've already said is a no-no. So changing your passwords to a pass phrase is very easy um, and it's a great way to improve your cybersecurity. When you choose a pass phrase, make it long. The longer the better. Aim for at least 14 characters, perhaps four or more random words that you remember. That's great. For example, green cabin moon boat. People laugh when I give them some of the pass phrases I give them, but they're very easy to say, very easy for them to spell, but extremely hard for a hacker to break into. The less predictable your pass phrase, the better. Sentences don't really make good pass phrases because they can be easy to guess. For example, it's, it's predictable to have spaces between words, uh, a capital letter at the beginning and punctuation at the end. Using a mix of random words is far more unpredictable and makes stronger passphrases. And then above all, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely critical, make your passphrase unique. Don't recycle your passphrases. Use a separate passphrase for every single per service that you're using external to your organization. So that if somebody manages to compromise one passphrase, they're not going to be able to reuse that on another service. If they break into your Commonwealth Bank account, the last thing you want them to do is be able to use exactly the same PIN number to get onto your NAB and your, your Westpac and all your other bank accounts. Next, let's talk about recognizing and reporting scams because I promised that we'd have a look at how you can avoid falling for them. You can protect yourself easily from scams by confirming independently if a business utility or government agency is indeed trying to reach you. Use their customer service numbers or their email addresses that are listed on their invoices, account statements and legitimate corporate and government websites. Don't be fooled. We've all heard the stories in the news recently of somebody who might have paid a, the, the final amount for their car when somebody called them up and asked them for their, their bank account details. Independently verify that somebody who's calling you is really from the organization you're, you're expecting to hear from. Hang up on unsolicited callers offering to fix computer problems. Companies like Apple and Microsoft don't contact you for tech support unless you've requested them to help you. They, and they will never ask you for personal information when they, if they ever called you. Report scams to the company or institution being impersonated so they can look at ways to, to thwart the, the attackers, the scammers. Don't give personal information over the phone unless you're sure of who you're dealing with because any bit of personal information could be useful in an identity attack. Don't make a payment and don't allow remote access. Never allow remote access to your computer to someone you haven't purposefully engaged to help you. Don't accept cold calls from people wanting to help you with that sort of thing. And never send money to someone that you don't know. To finish today's presentation, I just want to reiterate the importance of watching out for threats. The best way to beat cyber threats is to practice good cyber security and know what to look for. Get to know some of the common threats which we've discussed today. So you'll know what to do if it happens to you. Learn what to look for to secure your business and check out the Cybersecurity Center's Small Business Cybersecurity Guide. There's a guide that's been written specially for you. Remember cybersecurity training can count towards your, your continuing professional education. And again, the top tips to secure your business include, turn on multi-factor authentication, can't stress enough, Use passphrase or, or strong passwords. Manage and limit the use of shared accounts. Only provide system access or system admin access to those who absolutely need it. Update your software religiously. Back up your data. Use antivirus and ransomware protection. Reset old devices when you no longer need them or use them or you dispose of them. Keep your devices locked and secure. Educate staff on cybersecurity. Have a plan in place in case of a cybersecurity attack. Be prepared. And we recommend you assess the risk of cyber attack and consider 
consider if you need to take out any additional professional indemnity insurance, there is insurance for cyber threats um, to assist with first party losses um, arising from a cyber, uh, cyber attack and certainly seek IT advice where required. Better to be sure than sorry. Fantastic. No. Thank you so much for that, Craig. Yep. That's um, been wonderful. All of that information has been so helpful. Um, we've also had David helping us out in the questions today. So thank you so much for that, David. And um, we'll endeavour to put some FAQs together as well, because there were so many um, questions coming through and lots of really great information that Craig shared, but we'll capture some of that in our Q&A and we'll post that on our website shortly. Um, I also just wanted to give you some information on how to stay in touch with us. So if you would like some more information to keep up to date, uh, just visit our website at tpb.gov.au. Um, you can also follow us on social media at LinkedIn, Facebook and Twitter, and also highly encourage you to subscribe to our monthly newsletter, which is TPB eNews. And again, you can do that on our website. Um, and just um, note that we have recorded today's session and we do record all of our other webinars as well. So if you'd like to view any of those, you can jump on our YouTube channel and um, you can still claim CPE as well for viewing those videos. So I just want to say a big, big thank you to Craig for sharing all of those wonderful insights today. And also thank you to David for assisting us with the questions today. And we hope that that has helped you and it's been beneficial to you and to your businesses. And as I've said, you can count um, today's webinar towards your CPE. Um, and if you are interested in attending any more of our webinars, just jump on our website and go to tpb.gov.au forward slash webinar. Um, and just as always, once um, we finish up today, we'll have an exit survey which will launch in your browser and we would really appreciate it if you could just take a moment to complete that. Just um, gives us some ideas on how we can improve on our sessions and also let us know if there's any topics that you want to hear about from us as well and we will um, look at putting those together for you as well. So once again, I just want to say thanks everyone for joining us today and we do hope that you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Thanks Craig. Thanks everyone.